Hello, and thank you for joining. My name is Derek Kane, and today we're going to dive into the topic of Fourier analysis for machine learning. This lecture is just one lecture in a broader series of lectures diving into topics of data science, predictive analytics, statistics, and machine learning. The overview of topics that we're going to get into today is that we're first going to start with an introduction to Fourier analysis. You know, what is the concept, how does it work, and more importantly, how can we leverage it for machine learning concepts? We will then move into the topic of the Fourier transform. We'll discuss how we can use Fourier analysis in econometrics and time series modeling concepts. And then we will conclude with a practical application example where we will create a time series prediction using Fourier analysis on manufacturing order volume, and we're also going to incorporate the use of artificial neural networks. So the example here is actually a really interesting way to use machine learning in time series concepts, and it's, it's really a, a very cool one to look into. Before we dive into the topics in detail, we first need to have an introduction to what Fourier analysis actually is. And Fourier analysis is a mathematical method used to break down and transform a periodic function into a set of simpler functions. These simpler functions can then be summed and transformed back into the original form. A period function is a mathematical relationship between a quantity and a variable or variables whose relative values consistently repeat over some regular period of time. So we're looking at frequencies as a function of time. Let's now talk a little bit about the history of Fourier analysis. Fourier analysis, it was invented in the early 19th century by French physicist and mathematician Joseph Fourier. And Joseph Fourier transformed the partial differentiation equation representing the propagation of heat into a series of simpler trigonometric wave functions. So sines and cosines, if you remember back to trigonometry and you, how we work with angles, sines, cosines, and tangents, uh, Fourier had a very significant impact in this particular area. These wave functions could be superimposed to reconstitute the original function thereby providing a simpler general solution to the problem. The Fourier transform and Fourier's law were named after his contributions, and Joseph Fourier is also generally credited with the discovery of the greenhouse effect. So this concept of a Fourier analysis, and later when we get into the Fourier transform and how the mechanics work, really is one of the greatest mathematical ideas we've had in the early 19th century. It does quite a lot, and it really is the foundation of a lot of mathematical concepts in terms of number theory and has significant applications. Speaking of which, here are some of the applications of a Fourier analysis. We use it for acoustics. For signal processing, so if you're looking at MP3s or JPEGs or any type of general audio processing, you know, so if you're mixing your treble, your bass, and your mid-range, and you're using your stereo receivers, chances are there is some element of a Fourier analysis being incorporated. We can use it in terms of modern econometric work, so option pricing. Now, in mathematics, the technique is very deeply rooted in number theory, and Fourier analysis also has applications in statistics and probability theory as well. We get into the concept of harmonic analysis. So for musicians and looking at sound waves, there's a lot of applications in terms of how a Fourier analysis can, can work in that particular space as well. And of course, it can be used in image processing and in electrical engineering amongst its many applications. Now, one important note 
that I want to put here is our exploration of the Fourier analysis and the Fourier transform will be more conceptual in nature in order to prepare for the practical application of the technique. So I'm not really going to get into too much of the mathematical concepts. I mean, we'll, we'll see some elements of it, but I think it's important that we have an expectation of what we're actually going to get out of this particular presentation. So if you're looking for more mathematical proofs, you know, I would, I would suggest get the foundations of, you know, what the technique is actually applying and then, uh, you know, run some searches on the internet and you will find some really fantastic resources to draw from. So why is the Fourier transform so great? At the heart of this seemingly intimidating mathematical formula is a beautiful concept. So when we look at this mathematical formula, it's a fairly intimidating formula. And we'll, we'll break it down into its subcomponents coming up, but let's just think conceptually of what the Fourier transform actually is doing. What it is doing is this function is essentially transforming a function of time into a function of frequency. So let that sink in a little bit. So we're going to take a function of time, something which is occurring over time, and we're going to convert it into a frequency. This transformation has a profound impact on the nature of reality itself due to the relationship it draws between these two variables. So when we look at you know, how is it applied in mathematics and in some of the natural sciences, this relationship between converting from a function of time into a function of frequency uh, has some profound Im impact and influences. I like to think of this equation as the mathematical bridge between time and frequency, and much like Maxwell's equations governing electricity and magnetism. One of the weirdest results in quantum physics is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This principle states that for a given particle, the more precisely its position is defined, the more uncertain its momentum is and vice versa. In quantum mechanics, frequency is interchangeable with energy and therefore the energy of a particle is uncertain over arbitrarily small time frames. This allows particles in the quantum regime to borrow enough energy to tunnel through a potential barrier so long as they pay it back in a small enough time frame to be keeping with Heisenberg. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is essentially a theorem about Fourier transformations. So if you're interested in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and understanding the roots of this equation, after you have an understanding of Fourier transformations, you can kind of look at it in a different lens. But the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is a remarkable concept in physics, and at the heart of it, it's drawing from Fourier transformations. Well, what is this Fourier transformation we're talking about? A Fourier analysis begins with a Fourier transform. The Fourier transform breaks down or decomposes a single more complicated periodic wave function into a set of simpler elements called a Fourier series that takes the form of sine and cosine waves or complex exponential equations. These can then be solved using simpler mathematics and superimposed or recombined to yield a solution to the original function via a linear combination. The decomposed elements in a Fourier series are sometimes referred to as harmonics. So when we use the term harmonics in the context of a Fourier transformation, this is what we're talking about, these decomposed elements. And it's not to be confused with the musical terminology of harmonics. Narrowly defined Fourier analysis refers to the process of decomposing the original function into a series of simpler components. 
More generally, it can also include Fourier synthesis, which is the process by which the original function is reconstituted by performing an inverse transform. Fourier synthesis essentially runs the Fourier analysis in reverse. So we're taking these smaller wave components, we're recombining them in order to recreate the original wave. Fourier transformations are like musical notation. We can sing a song from memory, but we can also write down what to play. If you play the right keys together, it sounds exactly like the original song. In other words, we are adding up frequencies to recreate the original waveform. Musical notation is what you might call a time-resolved Fourier transform. You're creating slices in time, and at each time step, you are specifying the frequency spectrum, in this case, the chords. Another example which fits this idea is related to cooking of recipes. We can describe a dish by what it tastes like. So when I take a bite of something, I can taste the sugar, I can taste the salt, I taste a pecan, I taste raisins, baking soda. However, we can also describe it by the ingredients used to cook the dish. If we add the right amount of ingredients in the right amount, we can actually recreate the taste. So we can taste a food item, deconstruct it into its fundamental components, if you will. And if we understand exactly the right quantities of these fundamental components, it is then theoretically possible to rebuild back up to the original dish in this case. And that's the, the essence of the Fourier transform. Now there's some other really interesting features to the Fourier transform. We can apply it to recreate the shapes of two-dimensional objects. So here, what we're looking at is an image where we have an original shape, which is, it's a two-dimensional shape, but it's, it's complicated. You can see, I mean, it's got a curved edge on one side, and then there's these protrusions that are like legs coming out on the other end. And through a series of harmonics, we can see that as we progress to higher harmonics, that the shape itself is being reconstructed through the combination of all these harmonics. So in, in our example, if we look at 200 harmonics down in the bottom right hand side, we see that we can build up back to the original shape. Here's another example where we're taking an outline of the leaf at the right summarize using 1, 5, and 10 harmonics, which in this case we're using an elliptic Fourier analysis. Here is a representation of a complex image processing approach through a Fourier transformation. So we talked about being able to look at images and process information out of images through the Fourier transform, and we can see that we can break it down into high and low spatial frequencies. And from these frequencies that we're working with, we can then apply the Fourier transform. Stuart Riffle has a really elegant explanation in a single sentence, which describes the Fourier transform. So we had this intimidating formula earlier now we're actually going to break it down into something that's a little more palatable. What's nice about this is the different functions here are color coded. So when you, we look at this, you know, there are imaginary numbers, pi is in there. Uh, we have all sorts of subcomponents, you know, numbers, you know, along a particular path. But essentially what it is saying is that in order to find the energy at a particular frequency, we spin the signal around a circle, in this case this is the 2 pi that we see in the equation, at that frequency. And then we average a bunch of points along that path. So this daunting 
formula involves imaginary numbers, complex summations, but the idea really is fundamentally simple. One way to think of it is imagine an enormous speaker mounted on a pole playing a repeating sound. The speaker is so large you can see the cone move back and forth with the sound. We mark a point on the cone and now rotate the pole. We trace the point from an above ground view. If the resulting squiggly curve is off center, then there is frequency corresponding. The pole's rotational frequency is represented in the sound. So here is an image that, that depicts what we're talking about here. The upper signal is made up of three frequencies or nodes, but only the bottom right squiggle is generated by a rotational frequency matching one of the component frequencies in the signal. So if you search online, you'll actually find some really nice animations from a number of different folks that walk through and show the Fourier transform as it's developing over time. And there's some really fantastic resources out there, and I would highly recommend you check them out. Well, brace yourselves for the Fourier series are coming. Now we're going to get into some of the heavier stuff, starting with the fast Fourier transformation. And what the fast Fourier transform, or the FFT, is an algorithm to compute the discrete Fourier transform and its inverse. A fast Fourier transform rapidly computes such transformations by factoring the discrete Fourier transform matrix into a product of sparse, mostly zero factors. As a result, fast Fourier transforms are widely used for many applications in engineering, science, and mathematics. In 1994, Gilbert Strang described the fast Fourier transform as the most important numerical algorithm of our lifetime, and it was included in top 10 algorithms of 20th century by the IEEE Journal of Computing and Science and Engineering. So the fast Fourier transform is a remarkable algorithm and is very versatile in terms of what it can do. Let's now go back into history a little bit and discuss the development of the fast Fourier transformation. The development of the fast algorithm for DFTs can be traced back to Gauss's unpublished work in 1805 when he needed it to interpolate the orbit of asteroids Pallas and Juno from sample observations. His method was very similar to the one published in 1965 by Cooley and Tukey, who are generally credited for the invention of the modern generic fast Fourier transform algorithm. While Gauss's work predated even Fourier's results in 1822, he did not analyze the computation time and eventually used other methods to achieve his goal. John Tukey, who worked at IBM's Watson Labs, came up with the idea during a meeting of President Kennedy's Science Advisory Committee, where a discussion topic involved detecting nuclear tests from the Soviet Union by setting up sensors that surrounds the country from the outside. It, to analyze the output of these sensors, a fast Fourier transform algorithm was needed. Tukey's idea was given to Cooley for implementation while hiding the original purpose from Cooley for security reasons. As Cooley didn't work at IBM, the patentability of the idea was doubted and the algorithm went to the public domain, which, through the computing revolution of the next de decade, made fast Fourier transforms one of the indispensable algorithms in digital signal processing. By far, the most commonly used fast Fourier transform is the cooley tukey algorithm, although there are many other forms of the fast Fourier transformation. A fast Fourier transform computes the DFT and produces exactly the same result as evaluating the DFT definition directly. The most important difference is that the FFT is much faster. The FFT approach is a divide and conquer algorithm 
that recursively breaks down a DFT of any composite size into many smaller DFTs of sizes N1 and N2, along with multiplications by complex roots of unity, traditionally called twiddle factors. And these twiddle factors are named after Gentleman and Sand in 1966. And the depiction that we have on the left-hand side is of a twiddle factor, which to me it kind of looks like a snowflake or a tiny star, if you will, or the spokes of a wheel. Improved, expanded upon, and the core of what has come to be known as the field of harmonic analysis, Fourier analysis has evolved and progressed to include the study of more abstract and general phenomena. Fourier analysis is now used actively, regularly, and widely in econometrics and financial market theory by researchers and practitioners to forecast. So if we think about econometrics, time series, essentially we're looking at the development of markets over time. So since we know the time component is a critical element of Fourier analysis and the, uh, the fast Fourier transform, we can think about any type of application involving time in this construct of a Fourier analysis. Fourier analysis also is used to analyze and better understand the nature and behavior of a wide range of time series data and parameters that exhibit nonlinear relationships and repeating wave-like patterns over time. And that's kind of one of the key attributes of a Fourier analysis in econometrics research or financial market research is we have to look at time series data that is nonlinear in nature but having patterns repeating over time. Among its many applications, it has been used to model long-term economic cycles, the relationship between inflation and the demand for money and patterns and trends in stock, foreign exchanges, and housing markets, and cycles in the semiconductor industry. It has also been used to measure the efficiency of a national economy. Fast Fourier transforms are also useful as a high pass to remove low frequency periodic variations, so hourly, daily, weekly, and then what we can do is then we can back transform to the time domain and then use that as the input for your monitoring tools. So we can combine the use of a Fourier analysis with other machine learning and predictive analytics techniques in our data science arsenal. So not only can it be applied in econometrics in kind of this novel sort of way, but we can think of taking time series information, deconstructing it into certain components, through the Fourier transform, and then putting models on top of those deconstructed components. So that concludes our introduction to Fourier analysis and the fast Fourier transform. And now we're going to shift gears and move into a practical example. But before we do, I wanted to show this image because I think this is just absolutely fantastic is <laughs> he was sending me mixed signals. So I did a Fourier analysis, which to me is funny on so many levels. And I think after watching the first part of the presentation, it now makes sense. And if you actually go back to the overview page, uh, the second slide in the presentation, and you look at that joke about the Fourier transform on the cat, it's actually quite funny. So our practical example that we're going to get into today is going to be related to a manufacturer's order volume. And this is a very relatable business problem that I think many of us will be facing when we're working in data science, if we're working in a business context. We can think of it as manufacturing is a field where predictive analytics can have a significant impact on operational efficiency and risk. If we can plan our production volumes with greater degree of precision, 
then we can work on advanced topics such as utilization, capacity. We can address working capital type constraints. We can optimize our revenue, our margins, and ultimately bring this to higher return on sales and higher EBIT. Without trustworthy guidance on the expected amount of orders to be fulfilled in the near future, usually a significant stockpile of parts or raw materials and spare capacities are necessary in order to compensate for the variances in the volume of incoming orders. So if we don't know when our customers are going to be placing our orders, we can either allow them to be backordered or we can bring in a lot of inventory, which is tying up our capital. So it's increasing our overall working capital, and that's not good for a business. You want to be a little more liquid in terms of your cash. In this example, our goal is going to be to devise, we're going to develop a time series prediction to determine the projected order volume for a manufacturer. In this, we're going to utilize the fast Fourier transform and artificial neural networks to create the algorithm. Before we begin, I think it's important that we have an understanding of the data that we're working with. So when I look at the, the raw input data here, it's very simple, four columns of information. I have the year, the quarter, the week, and the amount of orders. And we're working on these weekly aggregates of the worldwide amount of orders normalized in between a zero to one interval in this case. The value of the week and quarter columns is relative with respect to the year. And this data set contains values from the first quarter of 2009 through the first quarter of 2011. And before we move into the next sections, this analysis is all being constructed using the R language. Now, I know you can use this in Python and other techniques, but I just want to let you know as we're walking through this example, even though I'm not posting the code, it is R-based in nature. And I do have that code readily available. So one of the first things that we do is we're going to invoke ggplot2 in this case. And we're going to review the order volume to see if there's a frequency of the pattern. Because remember, our time series, we want to look for frequencies and regular intervals in the time series. So we're just doing an exploratory data analysis, trying to understand if this time series is something that fits into a fast Fourier transform. And it is apparent that there is a lot of similarity between the two full years and the one full quarter we have data we can see as each week is progressing throughout the year, there's a normal ebb and flow to the business. And, th and this is an important characteristic that we have to hone in on. And to me, there actually seems to be a very strong periodicity uh, across the quarters as well. And what this does is this suggests that there is an underlying structure in the data that can be used for forecasting. However, there seems to be a strange one-week difference between the apparent peaks of the two full years. By changing the graph into a bi-quarter histogram of the week values, it uncovers the cause very quickly. There was one more business week in the first quarter of 2009 than in the first quarter of 2010 and 2011. So having a longer time frame to look for, more orders were stacked in that one particular quarter, which is essentially skewing the data. But we can see this very quickly through an effective EDA. Consequently, there is a consistent one week difference between the last weeks of the quarters. However, due to the sudden surge of new orders, from the business point of view, this is exactly the week that counts the most. So this lag of one week going from quarter to quarter normally wouldn't be too much of a concern. We can address it in certain ways. However, this is where we have the big spike, and this is the one that we have to look at in the greatest amount of detail.
The model building approaches we will use later can usually cope with such a one week offset discrepancy. Here is what we can tell now from these plots. So let's go back to each one of these quarters and let's, let's see what we can infer from it. At the very end of the quarter, there is always a significant spike in the orders for Q3 and Q4. Even the exact amounts are very close. During the quarters, there is also significant similarity between the orders. On the whole, the time series seems to be stationary and highly periodic. Therefore, it should be worthwhile to analyze its characteristics in the frequency domain. A visual inspection hinted at a strong periodicity in the time series at the quarter, half year, and year intervals. In order to prove this suspicion, we now perform a brief power spectrum analysis of the first two years of the data. 2011Q1 is omitted here. We would like to look at full years to uncover possibly yearly periodicity. Also, this analysis will lead us to the training data for the forecasting approach, and 2011Q1 is kept for backtesting purposes. So remember, with time series and general statistical time series predictions, we want to validate our results up against a set of actual known data. So in this case, we're going to hold off Q1 2011 to validate these models up against. We apply the common fast Fourier transformation, extend the results with the frequency member index, and plot the value of the complex modulus, the frequency index. Note that the zero frequency component is omitted here. Also, as the input signal is real valued, it is symmetric in the remaining frequencies. Therefore, only the lower half of the spectrum is plotted. This results in the following power spectrum plot that uses the complex modulus to measure magnitude. So this is essentially, we can think of these as our frequency wave patterns. Now, it is apparent that a number of these frequencies have significantly higher amplitude than the others, hinting at a strong underlying periodic nature in the data. Let's identify these peaks. So if I'm looking at this chart and I'm looking where the major peaks are at, we see them at 0, 18, 16, 24, 32, 40, and 48. Most notably right here. What we see is that a component with a frequency of 8 divided by 104, which is 2 times 4 quarters in the two full years, and its harmonics. An important note is the exact difference of 8 between the peaks seem to dominate the signal. So when I'm looking at this particular frequency pattern, these peaks are so significant um, with a difference of 8 between each one of the signals here. However, these frequencies alone are insufficient to capture the time series to the precision we would like to. To demonstrate this, we eliminate the frequencies with small magnitudes in a copy of the Fourier transform. The remaining ones are transferred back to the time domain an inverse fast Fourier transform call in order to be compared to the original time series. So this is the concept of we're now taking this wave, deconstructing it into the smaller components, and then we're reconstructing it back to its original function and now we're comparing it against uh, the actual data in this case. The signal we deal with shows strong regularity, but is at the same time highly complex, and it's decidedly nonlinear. So when we look at the time series and how it is evolving over time in this case, we see that there is a nonlinear pattern. Therefore, for forecasting purposes, we split it into simpler periodic time series, and then we train artificial neural networks for the finite time window forecasting of each simplified component. 
The splitting is based on a non-overlapping partitioning of the frequency domain. And this is a nice way of saying that when we're taking our complex wave signal and we're breaking it down into its components, that we're just looking for components that aren't interfering with other components. Therefore, our prediction approach is the following. New time series data is concatenated to the training set as it becomes available. This new extended time series is again split with the same band pass filtering utilized for the training data. The new simplified time series set, the elements of which are extended with the images of the new observations, is used to exercise the corresponding forecasting neural network. And the key point is that the order of forecast for the unsplit signal is reached by summing the outputs of the component forecasting neural networks. So we're taking our time series, and as new information is becoming available, then we're evaluating the entire series, breaking it down into simpler subcomponents, and then we are forecasting on these smaller subcomponents. After these forecasts have been created, then we're going to aggregate them and build back up to our final prediction of the time series. So let's talk a little bit about the signal decomposition. So we split the frequency domain of the time series into intervals. And this is what I was talking about before, where we can see each one of these seven subseries are breakdowns and their waves at different interval levels. Each interval contains either the fundamental frequency of the strong periodic signal or one harmonic of it. This is effectively a bandpass filtering based decomposition. For the two year time series and harmonic set, this produces the following decomposition in the time domain. We use the multilayer perceptron feed forward artificial neural network model to map a finite time window of order observations onto predictions about the orders that can be expected in the future. We will have a number of neural networks, each one responsible for learning and predicting a frequency band of the original. We assume that cutting up the original signal by using frequency bands results in sub-signals that are fundamentally easier to predict. And that's why we, we are basically breaking these signals into smaller components, because we're trying to simplify the signal through each iteration of the bandpass filtering. Note, in the following section where we're training it, we're working actually with a slightly different time series. So we're only looking at 105 observations, and the main frequency harmonics in this case are slightly different. They're at 9, 17, 25, 33, so on and so forth in our Fourier series. The results of the neural network trainings for the different decomposed signals can be seen on the figure to the right. The red line is the response of the network, and the black is the original time series. All training data fits very well, and the response of the neural networks at the training samples is accurate. So when we're looking at the black line versus the red line, we see that it's mimicking the structure quite well. The mean squared error for all the training data is smaller than 10 to the negative 5. So as expected, just from a visual observation, we expect the error to be very low, and we actually see that it's very low in this case um, through the mean squared error metric or statistic. Because the Fourier transform is a linear operation, the sum of the individual predictions will give the full time series prediction back to us. So when we add up all of these various decomposed elements, we should return to an aggregate prediction. We mentioned earlier that we have used only the first eight quarters as training data, so we left out Q1 of 2011. Now we will use that data for the last ninth quarter and check how well we can predict with a one-quarter horizon. So, 
So we're taking our original data and now we're building our model off of it and we're pre predicting forward one quarter. In this approach, we predict one week, use the result of the prediction to augment the historical data, and then exercise the predictor with this new input again. So we're kind of layer by layer building out our prediction in this case. Theoretically, this feedback strategy can be used to predict to arbitrarily long horizons in the future. Well, let's look at our prediction results. So here, the error is calculated as the root mean square error statistic for the predicted time series. The root mean squared error value is 0 0.08, which is a relatively low uh, error rate. And we can actually see when we're looking visually at the, the red and the black lines in this case, we see that the error metric follows in suit fairly well. Now we may also want to know what kind of data should be predicted by the single neural networks, thus what kind of forecast would result in a perfect prediction. So in this example, the training data signals are black, the predicted signals are red, and the blue lines are the signals that would have belonged to the perfect prediction. So we can see how our actual data was developing over time through our uh, through our feed forward strategy in training this particular time series, and we can compare our prediction against the observed against the perfect prediction in this case, highlighted as blue. The signals that were predicted more accurately where were the signal was periodic, and those signals had the highest errors where the trend was dominant, the first and the second signals. Here is the final recombination of the prediction for the next 14 periods. So we talked about we had these different harmonic series that are built. And remember, we have to add them all together because they're linear in nature to get to our final prediction. So if I take the sum of each one of these harmonics, I have my prediction. And then I can now bring the data back to the data frame. I can use C-bind, R-bind, and our full suite of tools in R. And now I can create you know, comparison metrics between actual and the predictive performance. Well, that concludes our tutorial on 4AA analysis. Thank you very much for joining. It was a pleasure walking through these concepts with you. And make sure to check out some of my other videos. And you know, if these are concepts that you like, feel free you know, to comment on them or you know, send me a message on YouTube or to my Gmail account. And best of luck.